It's hard to fathom now, but we used to be able to arrive at the airport just minutes before a flight. We'd keep our shoes on and we went through a simple metal detector and virtually anyone could go right to the gate without a boarding pass or even showing an ID. But all this changed on September 11, 2001, when 19 men who knew this exploited lax airport security measures in the United States. This allowed the hijackers to commandeer four airplanes and use them as jet field field missiles as they flew them into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center and two other places, killing nearly 3,000 people. This singular event brought significant changes to aviation, and on this 20th anniversary, Aviation This Week takes a look at how these changes are making aviation safer. A warm welcome to the program. I'm Bukola Ju Kitsumbi, and our flight is set for takeoff. Quite a large number of young adults worldwide population are too young to remember what air travel was like before September the 11, 2001. Those were the times when passengers' loved ones used to be able to greet and bid them farewell at the gate, and travelers weren't required to take off their shoes and belts or remove liquids from carry-on luggage before going through checkpoints. <laughs> Pre-9-11, you can virtually go to any airport that virtually just walk through. But now, in some airports, you are practically dressed down naked to check each and every nook and corner of you, you know. As it is now, we we'll have to pull off our shoes because after the 9-11, it has also been discovered that people plant bomb inside their shoes just to pass through. And people make use of a threat item like a knife. They build it inside their shoe. Where the aircraft are parked, they are guarded 24-7 because threats can come from any angle. Threats can either come from the land side or the air side. So that is the more reason at the air side, for example, the perimeter fences must be checked at all times by the security patrol teams. They check the perimeter fences at all times. Then continuous cutting of clearing of bushes for clear visibility is done at, at the air side. The entire industry, from airport security to flight attendant training, to even the number of airlines in existence, was reshaped by the deadliest terror attack in US history. That clear blue morning of September the 11, 19 hijackers turned four Boeing jetliners, two American airliners, and two United Airliners planes into missiles. Owing to the enormity of the disaster, aviation as a whole took a turn for the good. Passengers were then prohibited from bringing knives, razor blades and other sharp objects in the cabin. Liquids and gels, with the exception of small containers, aren't allowed in carry-on bags after British officials stopped a terror plot to bring liquid explosives on flights in 2006. It can be more than 100 ml. Even if the liquid is 100 ml and you are putting it in a bigger container, a bigger container that is more than that 100 ml, it should not be allowed to pass. What we've been able to look at uh, from the 9-11 has to do with face identification. We should be able to match your face on the boarding pass, I mean on the ID card. We should be able to match your name as well. If you must, at any point in time, assess a restricted area, you have to be properly badged, and you must have a business to do at that restricted point. Aviation security experts acknowledge that prior to 9-11, no one envisioned suicide terrorists wanting to use commercial airplanes as weapons and being willing to kill themselves in order to kill hundreds of innocent people. Now, counter-terrorism officials work hard to imagine the unimaginable and enhance defences to prevent the ever-changing and growing threats to aviation security. On our interview segment, we speak to the former MD of Aero Contractors and it tells us about the changes 
that took place in the cockpit after 9-11. The doors were reinforced, uh, the access was uh, clearly given to only uh, the pilots and the cabin crew. Uh, sometimes the cabin crew cannot even have access if the pilots change the code of the, of, the, uh, of the cockpit. Now that also came with a price because if you look at 2015, the German wings uh, uh, incident or accident that happened over the Alps the pilot locked himself inside the cockpit and then uh, nobody could go inside because of uh, mental health that uh, alleged uh, the, 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 the co-pilot had. So also that opened up a lot of debates, uh, a lot of uh, generated a lot of controversies of whether the cockpit door can be, uh, after reinforcing it of course, uh, can, can be locked and then nobody can enter. Now we are seeing um, some more developments coming up where if the pilot has to go to the toilet, what kind of procedures do you need to follow? So airlines have adopted uh, uh, so many procedures that uh, will address the German wing incidents and will also address the 9-11 incidents. So they want a second barrier. Training has changed completely for the cabin crew, for the pilots. Uh, the, uh, the, most of the doors of the modern aircrafts now are bulletproof. They are very good doors and uh, they have access restriction with codes and everything. There are cameras now uh, to know exactly what, what's happening in the cabin before you open the door. And there's so many innovations coming up uh, with the new modern aircrafts. Also to restrict access and also to give uh, authorized access to, to, uh, to authorized personnel uh, who, uh, if, if they, uh, for, the, for the case of uh, uh, the German wings, uh, will have to go inside the cockpit to, to address uh, the problem. The cabin crew are trained for self-defense. The cabin crew are, are trained for so many uh, things that they could see could affect the safety of the flights. There are so many procedures that we have put in place, which is classified uh, for, the, for the industry, which we, we use. The procedures are very clear for the pilots. And every six, six months, they go through those procedures. They make sure that uh, they improve on it. Most airlines are constantly working to improve the safety and security of, uh, of, of uh, flights, especially uh, in the light of 9-11. When 9-11 happened, U.S. carriers alone lost uh, almost eight billion immediately, uh, and then of course thereafter they lost close to sixty billion uh, because of the recession in two thousand and six, which accumulated to two thousand and eight. Before nine eleven, in the United States, private airlines or private security companies were been, were used by airlines to to, uh, to to ensure security checks that have been carried out. After 9-11, uh, it became a federal uh, responsibility with the creation of TSA under the Homeland uh, Security uh, uh, Department. So they, crea they created the TSA, which now is a federal uh, government uh, agency, which now oversees security in all the airports and standardized those uh, those uh, security uh, checks that they are doing. And that created, uh, of course, uh, a level of uh, standardization across the United States uh, airport system. We, we here in Nigeria, we, we already have the responsibility of uh, security, airport security on fan. So the, um, the only thing is um, we, we should be keeping abreast of the next level of, uh, of uh, threats that will be coming to us. Still on 9-11, but this time the memorial which held in New York City. Terrence Edward Adderley Jr. 20 years after hijacked airliners smashed into New York City's World Trade Center and the Pentagon outside Washington, Americans did honor the nearly 3,000 lives lost on September 11, 2001. At the site of the World Trade Center in New York City, security was tight as families gathered for the anniversary ceremony. Daniel Lopez lost his father 
while Ken Dias, a flight attendant, lost five colleagues and a cousin. I ran away from this for 20 years, but I'm here to read his, his name today. So that's right, I am. His name's Daniel Lopez. As mine is, um, he worked on the 92nd floor of uh, Tower One for Car Futures. And he, um, we never found him, but he left us a message because uh, he found a phone somehow while he was up there. And he called saying that uh, his building had been hit, that he was going to stay by and try and help his co <coughs> his co workers evacuate. And that's the last square. I mean, we couldn't have ever imagined it. It was his second day on the job. He had never worked in New York City before, and he left a girl 10 years old and 8 years old, and he was my age, 46 at the time, and I mean, you can't ever explain this horrible thing, you know, and you relive it every year, but I mean, I think for the families, it's worse. The two young men are not the only one who lost relatives. Melissa Tarasewicz lost her father, the FDNY um, firefighter. Really hard day. My mom was a flight attendant at the time too, so I didn't know if I lost both my parents. So I um, was blessed with one. They did find my father and two other um, firefighters with him and a couple civilians. So it was nice to know that they were doing their job and until the end. And that's all you can ask for is that they did bring him home. I was blessed like that. A lot of families unfortunately weren't. So it was a really hard time. For this mother and daughter, the victim, yes. Julie Gaze, will forever be missed. <laughs> and so, uh, anyway, so she... Well, for a while, we just kept watching the people going across the Brooklyn Bridge, hoping that she was one of them. She wasn't. And so I think after about the end of the day, when other people that we know were hearing that their people got out and we weren't, it's kind of that sick, sick, feeling like she's not, she's not coming out. For many of the relatives, the past 20 years has been a roller coaster of emotions and sometimes hard days. Virgin's Hyperloop has completed the world's first passenger ride on a super high-speed levitating port system, a key safety test for technology it hopes will transform human and cargo transportation. Richard Branson is Virgin Hyperloop's owner, but the Chief Technology Officer Josh Gegel and Director of Passenger Experience Sarah Lucian were seated in the port as it uttered through a vacuum tube at speeds of up to 172 kilometers per hour at the company's developed test site in Las Vegas, Nevada. Yesterday's test was really to show that this system could be safe for passengers. And so most of the time where we have a low pressure environment inside the tube, and that would be like flying at about 50 kilometers of altitude. So usually the only people who fly in that wear spacesuits. But what you saw yesterday was Sarah and I just wearing normal clothing and getting in the vehicle. So we had to design the vehicle to be safe for us and safe enough for us to ride. In a hyperloop system which uses magnetic levitation to allow near silent travel, a trip between New York and Washington would take just 30 minutes. That will be twice as fast as a commercial jet flight and four times faster than a high-speed train. So that's really the next phase here is taking, you know, these, these initial versions, these two passenger versions, moving them to the 28 passenger versions through the technology development that we're doing right now. And then in project work, we're really looking at something, you know, in excess of a kilometer, moving on to 10 kilometers at like a, cer a certification facility that will allow us to actually get a full-blown kind of passenger certification for what we need to do. So for us, the steps moving forward are really to you know, continue to showcase that this technology not only works, but it's actually cost effective. And then the second piece is really to make sure that we can actually have the full length to get up to the speeds that we'd like. Virgin Hyperloop has previously run over 400 thirsts without human passengers at the Nevada site. The company is working towards safety certification by 2025 and commercial operations by 2030. With Emirates Airlines extending its suspension of flights to Nigeria until at least September 19, 
The COVID-19 Steering Committee says the Ministries of Foreign Affairs and Aviation will continue to dialogue with the representatives of the UAE to resolve the issue of the Emirates flights between Nigeria and that country. All of the various tests that they will be doing, and as a matter of fact, we'll expect further more tests if they want to. But they bounce back to us with a policy, with a rule, that we must fly Emirates into UAE. If you dare fly, say, Ethiopian Airlines, or Qatar, or Turkish, or British Airways, you must spend 14 days in that country that you're transiting through to go to UAE. So we thought this is a bad policy, and we thought this is targeted at our country, and we thought it's not acceptable for the obvious reasons that we do not have to have the visas, we don't have to have the money, or we don't have them. So we pleaded with them to reverse that rule or to remove that 14-day rule. And that's where we are. We've, we've gone through Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now we've been mandated by the task force jointly with the Foreign Affairs to resolve this impasse. It will be resolved. We're very sure it will be resolved, but it should be resolved in a fair manner to our team and passengers. Meanwhile, Nigeria's flag carrier operator into the United Arab Emirates says it stands by the federal government on its decision. I'm so proud of the Nigerian government for standing their own ground uh, on the, in the UAE face off. You, you cannot dish out instructions to a sovereign nation. You cannot disrespect a sovereign nation. And Nigeria, the government of Nigeria decided to stand up. That no, we cannot take this. Now, you see, these are part of the things I like about our president. He, he refused. He's protecting Nigerians' allies also by taking that stand. So it depends on both governments. Whenever uh, the UAV people are ready to do what the Nigerian government would like, uh, to do what the uh, Nigerian government deems very respectful of a sovereign nation like Nigeria. Passenger services between the UAE and Nigeria have been subject to restrictions since March 2021, as the federal government says its PCR testing is adequate for cross-border travel instead of an additional rapid PCR test to be taken four hours before an Emirates flight. Kenya's first low-cost airline, Jumbo Jet, has started a flight service to the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo city of Goma, looking to tap into a projected jump in demand for air travel in Africa. The carrier, which was launched in 2014 and is owned by national airline Kenya Airways, expects Africa to become one of the fastest growing regions for aviation in the world in the next two decades, with an average annual expansion of nearly 5%. Currently, when you look at the low-cost carriers, there are no low-cost car low carriers in the region. So basically for now, we are the big, biggest low-cost carrier in the region. So for us, is, um, is, the market is quite big and we will grow and serve the market and grow within the region uh, to the point of even setting up hubs within the region. Currently, we are setting our second hub in Mombasa. Uh, Nairobi is our main hub. Our second hub is, um, is, uh, is, is, is Mombasa. And who knows what Goma brings. Other Kenya firms, including its biggest bank, Equity and KCB Group, are also expanding into the Democratic Republic of Congo, a relatively untapped market. Jumbo Jet will fly into Goma, the capital of North Kivu province, twice a week from its Nairobi hub before increasing to four times a week. You find trade, tourism is big and you can grow a market, make it easier for businesses to operate, make it easier for people to move around, make it easier for tourism. The carrier operates a fleet of six the Avalon Dash 8400 planes and currently serves six local destinations from its Nairobi hub, including popular resort towns along the Kenyan coast. A teen pilot who is seeking to break the world record as the youngest woman to fly solo around the world touched down in Costa Rica early last week. 
19-year-old Zara Rutherford took off from an airport in western Belgium on August 18 in a Shark Ultralight, the world's fastest micro-light aircraft. She's looking to cover 51,000 kilometers in her bead. Flying into Costa Rica was amazing. It's a really beautiful country. It's a shame I can't stay longer. I wish I could. But uh, yeah, it was interesting. I, I, I couldn't talk to anyone on the radio for quite a long time, actually, because there was a mountain in the way. <laughs> um, but, but then, yeah, it's amazing seeing San uh, Jose from, from the sky, and I was like, yay, I'm landing soon. But yeah, it was good. The British Belgian flyer hopes a voyage will encourage more girls and women to study and work in science, technology, engineering and mathematics and spark girls' interest in aviation. So when I was younger, one thing that discouraged me was not seeing other women flying or not seeing other women in STEM, but science, technology, engineering and mathematics. So I'm hoping by what I can do is kind of, you know, answering their questions and you know, being there and having them see me fly, they can think, oh look, there's a girl flying, I can do that too. Um, that's what I'm trying to achieve. Rutherford is seeking to win the title from Shasta Wise, who became the youngest woman to fly solo around the world at 30. On the long legs, especially over water, so this, this was Iceland to Greenland, it was about four hours just over water, very low as well, and then you get quite lonely because there's no radio contact, uh, there's nothing, there's nobody there, it's just you and the plane. And then, so then I listen to music and podcasts, but it is something that I wasn't expecting when I started it. And I only realized afterwards, like, oh, you do actually get quite early. Rutherford's route will take about three months with stops in 52 countries, including China and Nicaragua, where she will stay with local families or in hotels. Egypt is optimistic about welcoming more visitors this year with numbers increasing steadily since January to around half a million tourists a month. Tourism revenue is an important source of foreign currency for Egypt and this plunged by 70% in 2020 due to the coronavirus pandemic. We are very optimistic uh, about the resumption because we received about 3 million tourists since the resumption, since the beginning of July 2020. But uh, the numbers are increasing uh, since January 2021. Now we are receiving around 500,000 tourists per month. Uh, more than 65% of them are coming to the Red Sea and the South Sinai Governorate because they are open air spaces and uh, water activities. And uh, it's exactly what the tourist is seeking after uh, the COVID. Uh, as for the revenue, uh, now we are running around 50% of our numbers before the pandemic. So it's a loss of 50% of our income, around $500,000 per month. Tourism in Egypt usually accounts for up to 15% of the country's gross domestic product. Monthly tourism revenue stood about $500 million in April, half of what they were before the pandemic. But Egypt hopes for a recovery by the end of the year when it aims to have vaccinated tourism staff in resorts along the Red Sea and name the area a COVID-free destination. Egypt and Russia in April agreed to resume all flights between the two countries. Flights to resort destinations Sham al-Sheikh and Urgada were suspended after a Russian passenger plane crashed in Sinai in October 2015, killing 224 people. This is our final destination on the program. See you next time, God willing. I'm Bukola Ju, Ukitumbi.